Hello, everybody. We're just going to give a, a minute for everybody to uh, get in from our waiting room. We had quite a few people waiting there for us. Um, and we'd like to try to start as right on time and we'd like to finish on time because we know people are here for their lunch time. So uh, um, we're gonna try to keep everything on time today. Awesome. I think we have about um, over 70 people registered for today's session. Um, we do tend to get, you know, uh, a few people that drop out at the end, but uh, it's looking exciting for um, our last one. I think we had 73, which was a kind of a record for us, uh, which is amazing. And we're seeing lots of new people uh, joining us. So that's also very exciting. So, okay. I'm just gonna share my screen and then we're gonna get started. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today for another Watershed Wednesday with the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. Uh, my name is Leah Kongsrud. I'm the executive director here at the NSWA and uh, really glad to see so many people joining us today. So we are having these Watershed Wednesdays every fourth Wednesday on um, February, March and April, and then as well in September, October and November this year. So normally we'd have in-person educational forums in February and October, um, but this is kind of our alternative to uh, in the COVID conditions and uh, we're really excited about it. So even moving forward, once restrictions are done, we might have a bit of a hybrid because um, having you know, online webinars is really, um, I guess, enabling. It brings more people into our table and becoming more informed. So, but we also have heard very clearly with people is that they miss our in-person forums. So uh, when it becomes safe enough, uh, we will start meeting again in person. So, so um, besides myself, I'd like to introduce some of the other staff who are joining us today. So we have uh, Rachel Bootsma, um, who is a watershed technician. We have Elisa Bros, who's our office and key stakeholder uh, coordinator. Michelle Gordy, who's our watershed planning coordinator, and you're gonna hear from her today in one of our presentations. Billy Milholland, who's our communications coordinator. Uh, Mary Ellen Shane, who's another watershed planning coordinator. And a new uh, term staff we have, uh, Brad Thiessen, who is helping us with our GIS and map making. So those are some of the other faces that you might not see, but they're behind the scenes here, making everything look really smooth and working easily. So before we get dark started, I really would like to acknowledge that um, the NSWA and our, our webinar today is, uh, we're doing this on the ancestral and traditional lands of uh, Treaty 6 territory, which is a meeting ground, a gathering place and a traveling route for Cree, so too, Blackfoot, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and also the homeland of the Métis. So we do acknowledge all First Nations, Métis, Inuit, in whose footsteps that we marked these lands for centuries. So just a few housekeeping items is, um, yeah, please, you know, turn off your video and keep muted during the presentation. Uh, that just helps us a little with bandwidth. And then if you would like to answer a question, please use the chat feature. So if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, there'll be a little box there that says chat. If you click on it and open it up, it'll give you a little spot there where you can type in a question. The questions will be addressed at the end of each presentation. And um, we'll try to focus on the questions that do, that do um, kind of relate to the presentations that are today going on today. And as in our last few sessions, we are gonna have some um, just fun polling questions um, about watershed or watershed issues. And another thing we're doing today that's a little bit different and uh, is we're gonna offer a gift basket. So um, for the people who are attending, we kind of have a list of names. And so towards the end of the um, uh, forum, I'm going to uh, pick a name at random and a person is gonna get a gift basket, which will include our living in the shed book, um, our calendar, although it's, it's almost the end of March, um, one of our really cool camping mugs and some other small things and items. So stay posted for that. So um, 
I would like to uh, kind of get started with maybe our first poll, uh, which is just a general question around kind of what area or what sector do you represent? So we can kind of get an idea of, you know, um, are you from um, industry or agriculture? Which kind of group um, you belong to? So just fill in the quick survey and then we'll share it right away. Um, they're fine. Lots of people are answering already. We're almost totally completed. So we'll give it another few seconds. So it looks like we've got lots from municipal government, uh, some from others. Okay, let's share that. So it looks like uh, a lot from municipal government. So watershed stewardship groups too are really re are really highly represented today. Cool, and industry and, and some um, mysterious others as well. So thanks, Lisa. And as I said, we'll do another um, uh, poll between the two presenters and then one at the end. So today's theme for Watershed Wednesdays is uh, lake management. So in February, we talked about Sturgeon River watershed and today we're focusing on lake management. And in April, we're gonna be talking about riparian assessment work in the watershed. So if you ever wanna see um, past presentations or what's coming up, um, I've just done a quick screenshot here of our, our home page on the NSWA website. And at the, at the kind of at the bottom of the page, there's a section called what's going on. And you can always find out here, you know, our speaker series and it'll link you to all the important things that uh, you need to find. So our first presentation today is going to be presented by pa uh, Petra Rowell, and it's going to be on the Waterman Lake Watershed Management Plan. And uh, I kind of challenged the presenters to come up with kind of a fun uh, title for the presentation. So uh, Petra said, how about plans, people and possibilities at Waterman Lake? And I thought that was, uh, was excellent. So, well, I um, let uh, Petra get set up and I'll do a little introduction. So Petra Wow graduated from the University of Alberta in 1990, and she has 30 years experience as a working biologist in wildlife. She's worked in Alberta on migratory bird studies, endangered species recovery, and land stewardship programs. And over the last decade, and many of you who have seen Petra in our circles, she's been focusing on Alberta's provincial water policy. So assisting multi-stakeholder partnerships in developing policies and programs to support the implementation of the Water for Life strategy. So Petra, welcome. And I also have to add is that uh, Petra is now uh, working with the Athabasca uh, Watershed Council as their executive director. So uh, she's now a, um, a co-worker with me and I'm very excited to, uh, to have her join our, our, our WPAC world. Petra, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Can you see my presentation? You bet. Great. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for asking me to come and share today. Um, I've had the privilege of working with a number of stakeholders in the Wobbleman Lake area to produce a, a watershed management plan for the Wobbleman Lake watershed. And yeah, I like that you challenged me to come up with a good title, People, Plans and Possibilities. And then I had to really think about, well, what am I gonna talk about? So today, um, because I've done a couple of presentations on the Watershed Management Plan, I am gonna focus a little bit more on the people or users of Wabaman Lake. And because I'm sort of moving on to another job, I'm gonna sum up some of the, what I see as some of the possibilities for the folks that are going forward with implementing the Watershed Management Plan at Wabaman. So I hope this works. It's my first time with this presentation, so I hope everybody enjoys it. Um, so just starting to think about the people, who are the users of Wabaman Lake? And there's really good evidence that Wabaman Lake has been used by indigenous people for thousands of years. There's an archeological site just to the south of the lake. And you can sort of imagine, you know, in the days when there were, you know, nomadic tribes of, of indigenous people moving perhaps down the North Saskatchewan River, that it wouldn't be that hard to follow the Wabaman Creek up to Wabaman Lake. And of course the lake at different times in its history was known as White Whale Lake because it had such a large whitefish population. So you can imagine, um, early Indigenous people fishing, spending the summer fishing along the lake. 
And of course, in more recent history, the Paul First Nation settled on the shores of Wabam in, in as early as 1892. And of course, today, Wabaman Lake is in Treaty 6 and Region 4 of the Métis Nation. And obviously, skipping fast forwarding to a more recent times, um, again, Wabaman Lake has been in use, you know, almost over the last 150 years. Um, explorers like Captain John Palliser passed by it in the 1860s. Um, and it wasn't very long after the turn of the century when people were going out because it was such a great recreational site. Believe it or not, the village of Wabaman was actually established in 1912, which was about the time that the railway, the, the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway was built uh, on the North Shore going past Wabaman Lake. So a whole village, uh, you know, was developed in response to the railway and in response to tourism and, uh, and things like moving, uh, catching fish and moving the, taking the fish back into Edmonton and later coal. Um, so there's a, I have to point out, there's this really fantastic history site. If you're interested in the history of the area, kind of the Tri Lakes area, Wabaman, Lac Saint Anne and Lake Isle, there's a wonderful website it's called Local History Tongue in Cheek One. I have no idea who's done this, but it's a fantastic website. So it's interesting to think that tourism 120 years ago uh, was a big thing out at Wabaman Lake. And of course, industry came along uh, very early as well. So there was coal strip coal or underground coal mining in at Wabaman as early as 1910. Um, later on, they started the strip mining in the 1940s. And again, that, er that early coal was coming back into Edmonton to heat homes. And then when strip mining started, um, it started to supply power generation plants. So over the years, we had the mines open and more power plants built. And now in more recent years, we're sort of seeing the end of that phase. So some of the coal mines are being closed and, and the land being reclaimed and the power generation is being converted to natural gas. So a whole lifetime of, of industry out at Wabam. Many of you online probably know Wabaman because it's a great place for fishing. And over the years, again, all, over more than 100 years, it supported uh, um, indigenous commercial and recreational fisheries. At one time, the commercial whitefish fishery was really important. Um, and there's some fantastic numbers about how much a whitefish was, how many pounds of whitefish were taken out of the lake. Um, walleye were, were present in 1912, but disappeared and then were reintroduced again in the 1980s. Today, the commercial fishery is gone, but recreational fishing, particularly in the winter, is important. Um, and there's lots of, of information about how the fisheries managed today. If there's any grad students out there or, or keen historians, this would make a great paper to write a history of how the fishery has been managed at Wabaman Lake over the last hundred years. I'd love to see that article written or it'd be a book. <laughs> so that kind of brings us up to people today. So today there are five summer villages on Wabaman Lake. There's only, those residences only record about 235 permanent residents but there's estimates that that's only about 10% of the whole, you know, the, the, the um, summer population. There's Parkland County with about 27 subdivisions around the lake. And Parkland also manages the hamlets of Wabaman and Fallis. That's maybe adds another thousand people directly around the lake. But of course, the whole county has population of about 33,000. Paul First Nation on the east end of the lake has a population of about 1,100. But the real elephant in the room when we're looking at people today is the greater Edmonton area where you have about 1.4 million people looking for a great place to recreate. And with Wobbleman less, you know, about an hour away from the city, that's probably where a lot of the recreational pressure is coming from and certainly will in the future. So this has led to things like uh, the number of boat launches on the lake to address those people coming in. Um, it's interesting, we, you know, look at boat launches, but we don't really know what is the capacity of Wapaman Lake. 
Um, how many boats should be on Wabaman at one time? That's something we should probably figure out in the near future. There's five sailing clubs. There's four outdoor education camps. There's a number of, there's the provincial park and a number of RV resorts. So about 850 people can camp there at any given day. And it's an old statistics, statistic, but in the 90s, the provincial park recorded about 25,000 day use parties and 7,500 occupied campsite nights annually. So if you think of every car as kind of a day use party, there would be 25,000 of those over the course of the year. So it's a pretty busy, popular place. So we all love our lake and we have to start wondering, are we loving it maybe to death? <laughs> There's lots of issues that arise from our use. Things like invasive species traveling in on boats, um, more blue-green algae blooms from being nutrient rich. That nutrient load is coming from residential development, recreation, loss of the riparian filter, agriculture and industry. You know, it's, a, it's the cumulative impact of everything and with climate change layered on top. So we need to start thinking about the cumulative effects of development and climate change. And we also need to think about how we're managing the lake. Is our governance uh, aligned or is it fragmented? Um, do we have effective policies and legislation or are there gaps? So my takeaway from looking at, you know, the people, the users and over a hundred years of use, what does that tell us? Well, for me, I, it made me think that, you know, Wobbleman Lake has provided more than a century of cultural, social, economic and environmental benefits. We've, we've mightily benefited from this lake. And we have many systems and resources in place to manage things individually like the fishery, the coal, the agriculture, growth and development around it. But what's the system for managing the lake itself? And where are the resources to manage the lake itself? It seems like we've put in a lot of systems in place, but have we forgotten the lake? I hope most of you are familiar with the idea of the tragedy of the commons that when something is publicly owned and there's no one individual owner, no one individual or company is responsible for managing the lake. So has it been overlooked? Is it a victim of the tragedy of the commons? Well, in lacking thinking about that system, that's why a number of stakeholders got together recently and started to develop a watershed management plan for Wobbleman Lake. It's a tool that helps us put that system in place. What is a watershed management plan? You know, it's simply a roadmap. It's just a, a getting together and figuring out where we are today and where we need to go in the future. And I'll just point out that it's not just for the lake, it's for the, all the lands that drain into the lake and impact the, the health of the lake. So just going back to this slide, so the, uh, over the years, the Wobbleman, what, <laughs> the Wobbleman Watershed Management Council has done a lot of work leading up to the watershed management plan. They produced a state of the watershed report a number of years ago, and it identified some data gaps. So they went about filling some of that data, uh, things like the riparian inventory were done. They also reached out to others and developed a steering committee. And that steering committee, which includes the county and the summer villages and industry and, and the provincial government, um, together, they worked on developing a vision, objectives, they consulted with others, they wrote the report, they did some community engagement with the draft uh, document on the website over last summer, and now they're at the stage where they're finalizing the plan. But knowing that it'll always be a living document, it's a guide, it's a roadmap, and roadmaps, as we all know, change from time to time, depending on where we want to get to. So I'll go through the plan a little bit, uh, but fairly quickly. What's our shared vision? Our vision is that the Wabam and Lake watershed is a healthy ecosystem with a robust economy and a thriving community that demonstrates its collective responsibility to be the best stewards of the lake environment for current and future generations. So that's a mouthful, but it very pointedly uh, embraces environment, economy, and social values. So everything's in there and everything's important and everything needs to be balanced. 
Like everybody else developing a watershed management plan, we have to understand what the issues are for our lake, and we need to understand where there are information gaps that we need to fill. We have to also really brainstorm about what solutions are out there. What are the opportunities? Um, what can we, how can we grab onto those opportunities to the maximum to leverage our efforts? And from that, we can develop goals where we want to be and strategies, how we will get there and really drill down into specific action. What needs to get done? Who will do it? How will we find the resources? How will we know when we've made progress? So for the Wallerman Watershed Management Plan, the stakeholder group agreed to focus on four areas, water quality, aquatic ecosystems, land cover and land use and stewardship. Like many other lakes, water quality is really the, you know, the, 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 the most important part. If you don't have water quality, everything else falls away. Um, so water quality is their first area and they have a number of actions um, to look at water quality. First of all, we have to understand it really well. So we have to have a good monitoring evaluation and reporting program in place. We know that water quantity is tied to water quality. So we have to understand why the lake fluctuates and what's normal and be ready for that high, high years and low years. Um, we also have to understand the connection with groundwater. We know Wabaman Lake draws from the surrounding groundwater and also uh, supplies groundwater. So we have to understand those relationships. Next on everybody's list, as important as water quality is, we know that it's high, strongly tied to the health of the aquatic ecosystem, you know, the fish, the benthic invertebrates, the shoreline, the littoral zone, all of those things um, are, are important and tied together. Um, so some work has been done to better understand the shorelines, the riparian areas, and there's much more room to do more work around understanding uh, wetlands in the watershed as well. Some work done on biodiversity, but much more could be done. And if there's any point from today to take home is, man, we've got to make sure invasive species stay out of the lake. Right to the north of you, Lake Isle and Lac Saint Anne are, are fighting with flowering rush. And it's, it's a bit of a, I don't wanna say a losing battle, but it's certainly a challenge. So if you can keep invasive species out of Wabaman Lake, you're so far ahead. Why is land use? So we know that every, all the land that drains into the lake is important. Um, and we wanna make sure that those folks that are managing those landscapes, um, whether it's the county or the summer villages or industry, um, that they understand watershed principles and are incorporating those into their management documents. Um, you're in good shape and that Parkland County has already done a lot of work to identify um, environmentally significant areas and uses a number of tools like districting and reserve dedications and development setbacks to protect those sensitive areas. Um, and you want to share information. And again, the, the Wabaman Watershed Management Council has done a fantastic job on their website of sharing information about the lake and the watershed. And hopefully water managers are, are connecting to that website and finding that information. And the last thing around wise land use is we know that the land is going to be, look a little bit different in the next uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years. As the, as the coal mines are reclaimed um, largely to agricultural land and recreational land and perhaps some uh, residential development. So what does that landscape look like when the mine is reclaimed and Alberta Environment's doing a little bit of work just to sort of do some watershed modeling to understand that better. And last but not least is you have to have everybody engaged. Um, stewardship is so important. There's no point in you know, a handful of people doing work if others are, are um, destroying that work. So you need to get everybody on board. And the best way to do that is for neighbors to talk to neighbors. Um, but we can do more work to make sure they have opportunities to talk to one another. So that's sort of the, the plan in a nutshell. But then again, Leah challenged me to think about, well, what are the possibilities going forward? We have, we have people, we have a plan, what are the possibilities? And so I thought about just lumping these into sort of four buckets. I thought about policy, 
I thought about other people, other plans, not the watershed management plan, but other planning in the region. I thought about best practices and I thought about partnerships. And, you know, you don't have to think about these from, it's not a top down necessarily. It can be from the grassroots up. The big thing is just that um, we act on these in these four areas as much as we possibly can. So what do I mean by these four areas? Well, I thought about policy and I thought our, the possibility is that there's lots of opportunity to make sure that our policies are aligned for land and water management that benefits the watershed health. So we know there's lots of federal, provincial and municipal policies, but somebody actually has to go and look at those and say, are they consistent and, and do they benefit watershed health? And maybe a good example of that is we have uh, a provincial wetland policy, we have federal fish habitat, a no net loss policy. Well, what does that look like in regards to Wabaman Lake? Is it actually being achieved? Um, who's measuring it? Who's looking at it? Another example is that we have lots of provincial policies that promote tourism and recreation. But again, do we know what the boating density is for Wabaman Lake? Um, do we have enough enforcers out there enforcing voting regulations? Um, who's looking, making sure that we're, we're, that invasive species don't occur? So we have to balance those, the policies with what's actually happening on the ground. So what we really need is a, a great policy champion. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at municipal development plans. It's, it's fairly dry work. <laughs> but we need somebody who can get excited about comparing policies documents and making sure that they're aligned and, and that they integrate land and water management. And sometimes we get pushback saying, well, you know, um, industry might not like it if you're, if you're messing around with policies. That's not true. Um, policy, regulators, industry, developers, um, they all say they want a level playing field. Um, and that if, they, if all the policies in one area are the same as another area, that's a good thing. It's consistency and it's easier to operate in different areas if rules are similar. So I'll make the case we need a policy champion. Another opportunity is that there's a lots of other planning going on. There's planning at the um, regional level with the government of Alberta's North Saskatchewan Regional Plan, um, at the regional at the municipal level with the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Growth Plan. And at the local municipality uh, area with Parkland County doing area structure plans. So again, we need a planning champion to be looking at these different plans as they're developed and as they're renewed over time to, to again, make sure that they are um, including measures that are, are good for lake health. So for example, is the North Sask Regional Plan, once it's done, gonna be able to manage that recreation pressure that we know is gonna come from the Edmonton Metro area, that million and a half people that are looking for a great lake to come and recreate on. Um, same thing with the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Growth Plan. How are they gonna manage recreational opportunities for that million and a half people? And how do they um, help with things like infrastructure costs for managing people around Wabaman Lake. Um, as many of you know, Parkland County is now managing uh, what used to be the village of Wabaman. So I suspect there will be an area structure plan in the future. What does that look like? And, and how do they incorporate watershed management into that plan? And same thing with the reclaimed mine lands. What do the area structure plans look like? Um, how will they incorporate watershed health? Um, and again, who is sort of coordinating all of that planning such that cumulative effects on the lake. So again, from the public lands act ask, aspect, who's looking at all that planning to make sure that it's beneficial and aligned and integrated. So we need a planning champion. Best practices is an area that we often, you know, by the time we write our watershed management plans, we've talked about everything else. And then we say, oh yeah, and by the way, we should all be doing best practices. And then we move on and we never really get into it. Um, so again, we really need to be thinking more about best practices, whether you're just fishing on the lake or boating for the day, there's lots of information out there about how to make sure that you leave no footprint behind 
um, that you're not part of the problem, you're part of the solution. So you're observing best practices for boating. Um, if you're camping, you're not leaving any mess behind. Same thing for cabin owners. There's tons of resources so that cabin owners know how to reduce their footprint on the shoreline, how to have a healthy riparian area on your shore, um, how not to use soaps, um, you know, how to use phosphate-free soaps. And the Wapen Watershed Management Council um, actually did a survey of lake users and found that people are pretty willing to do stuff if they know what those best practices are. Um, again, the municipalities and the county have lots of information um, and they have lots of tools so they know how to use best practices. Um, sometimes they uh, maybe don't have the capacity to implement everything, so that's where partnerships and leveraging can come into play. Industry has best practices and they also have you know, regulatory minimums, but often they are willing to move beyond regulatory min minimums and implement best practices. Um, and it's same thing with agriculture. There's lots of programs to help agriculture implement best practices, but sometimes somebody needs to be there to help connect individual producers to those programs. So there's an opportunity for Wagam and Lake. We need a best practices guru. And finally, in my, in my list of policy plans, practices, partnerships is <laughs> the last opportunity. And the Wobbleman Lake obviously has been really good at fostering partnerships. The Wobbleman Watershed Management Council is a great partnership and, and has reached out to many other stakeholders. The North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance is, has been supporting the council and working together. Um, the Land Stewardship Center, OMS, um, lots of other conservation groups have been active about at Wobbleman Lake. Maybe the opportunity is to continue to look outside the box at what future partnerships might look like. Maybe there's more partnerships with some of those individual uh, producers, um, different industries. I don't know, but we, ha we have to think about that. So that's my uh, people, plans, and uh, possibilities talk. The next steps for the Wagaman Watershed Management Plan is the steering committee is meeting on March 30th, uh, where they hopefully will approve the plan. And they'll start talking about how they can implement uh, and start getting some actions going. I guess my last piece of advice uh, to the Wobbleman folks is just to continue to understand the, the users of the lake, the people and what their values are, and continue to leverage policy plans, practices, and partnerships. And I suppose at the end of the day, just continuing enjoying what a great resource Wobbleman has been and will hopefully continue to be for the next couple hundred of years. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Petra. I mean, it's a, it's a long history and, uh, you know, lots has gone on uh, in the last, you know, five years on doing the plans. But uh, even more so, I mean, there's a lot going on in the last hundred years. So uh, pretty amazing. So um, I think there might be just one quick question. Um, Mary Ellen, I think that was around. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so we had a, a question from Patrick and uh, he was wondering um, that you mentioned that there were five yacht clubs on the, on the lake, um, the Edmonton Wobbleman Sailing Club in Sunshine. He was just wondering what the other two were, if you uh, know offhand. I tried to Google it, I couldn't find the answer either. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure either. Maybe uh, there's a number of Wobbleman Watershed Management Council folks on today, so maybe they can type in the chat line some of the other ones. I might have had the number wrong. Yeah. And that might have been in the past. I know some have come and gone over time as well. Um, great. There, um, so a, a question that I have is, uh, and this might be something that you uh, um, might be able to answer, but, um, uh, or maybe it's for the Water Wobbleman Council themselves, but I was just wondering how much engagement the council gets from uh, non-residents, so people visiting the lake, um, and is there much buy-in from residents in, in Edmonton um, to protect and 
uh, invest in uh, keeping Wabaman as healthy as possible? That's a fantastic question. And I think, you know, again, the Wabaman Council um, did a survey, but I think the majority of the respondents were, were local, you know, residents uh, or cabin owners, seasonal cabin owners. So it's really hard for them to reach out to, you know, somebody that might just come for day use uh, to the provincial park or bring their boat out for the day. But that's something I encourage the council to think about. Yeah, how do we get in touch with that with that group of people from the city mm-hmm. and see what their thoughts are about um, um, how they value the lake and what they might be willing to contribute to lake efforts. There was a little bit of work done, I think, on Chestermere Lake a number of years ago, trying to get at that. And you sort of have to stand, you know, at the boat launches and have a questionnaire for those folks coming in in the summer to, to catch some of those non-resident mm-hmm. folks. Um, but we definitely need to do a lot more of that for all of our big recreational lakes. Okay. Well, thanks, Petra. I think we are out of time for questions. I see a few more uh, in here. Um, so maybe we can try to answer them just to using the chat as we move to our next presentation. If we have time, we can circle back and, and answer some of these at the end. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Yeah, and we do have our uh, other poll that we've we've just kind of launched here so it's just about um, lake activities um, so as you fill that out I'm going to um, start some introductions for the next one so our next presentation is a tale of two lakes so it's a comparison of antler and Hubble's state of the watershed report so these are two smaller lakes in our uh, watershed and uh, they had state of the watershed reports done around the same time so um, Michelle Gordy had worked on those and I challenged her to uh, come up with a short presentation um, I'm just looking at the poll and maybe we can share those results uh, favorite activities it looks like swimming is one of the top ones for sure watching wildlife and enjoying the view as well so very cool thanks everybody for filling out the filling out the poll. So Michelle Gordy is, as I said before, a watershed planning uh, coordinator at NSWA. And uh, she is also an extension coordinator for the Vermilion River uh, Subwatershed Alliance. She joined us in 2018 after completing her PhD in public health at the University of Alberta. Um, Her background is in ecological parasitology, say that 10 times fast, And specifically, she studied the importance of parasites in freshwater ecosystems with a focus on the transmission of swimmers itch uh, in Alberta lakes. So Michelle has always had a passion for water research and outreach, which has made for a smooth transition into her current role here at NSWA. And Michelle, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you, Leah. Can you see my presentation okay? Absolutely. Awesome. So that was an interesting poll result with swimming being the number one activity in lakes. So uh, if you do experience uh, swimmer's itch at all when you're swimming in those lakes, um, there is a reporting website you can go to um, at swimmersitch.info and you can actually report where you get your swimmer's itch uh, to help us understand uh, better where it is in the province. Um, That's something that I did during my PhD, so I'm happy to see that it's still going on as well. So today I'm going to be talking to you about a tale of two lakes. So I'm going to be comparing Antler and Hubble's Lake State of the Watershed reports. Uh, So when I first started working at the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance, it was right after I had defended uh, my thesis and uh, Dave True needed someone to write the Hubble's Lake State of the Watershed report. So that was what I was hired to do and I stayed on to then uh, finish up the Antler Lake uh, Stay of the Watershed Report. So both of these are very near and dear to my heart because uh, they are how I started here. So Petra gave us a really great introduction into watershed management planning and really all of the things that go into that, all the the considerations of people and places and planning and uh, that was just excellent. Um, So I congratulate the Wabaman Watershed Management Council for getting to this point of having this watershed management plan in place because it's a really important step in the process. 
Um, so some of the other uh, like stewardship groups like the Hubble's Lake Stewardship Committee and the um, Antler Lake Stewardship Committee, they are at a different stage in their um, in their process of lake management. And that is that they have developed state of the watershed reports. Um, they both received some funding from um, the Land Stewardship Center and um, also from um, Strathcona County for the Antler Lake report. And so we were able to do this. And the state of the watershed report is really just a baseline of information of what do we know about the lake and its watershed. And the process is really just to gather all of the information that is out there, summarize it, and to share it. And so both of the reports are available on our website. Um, I'm definitely not going to be able to talk to you about everything in these reports today. It's going to be a high level summary. Um, but really, you need to have these reports in place in order to then start to develop a watershed management plan so you can take action. I mean, you can start taking action ahead of time, but really, um, you want those actions to be guided by what the needs are. So when we look at a lake and its watershed and we generate these reports, we look at everything because it's all connected. So we look at the underlying land structure, such as the bedrock geology, the landforms and soil, because those all affect groundwater. We look at the overlying land structure uh, that affects our surface water as well as our groundwater. So um, human developments, the riparian zones, agriculture, wetlands, forests. Um, we look at lake water quality, so uh, influences on the quantity uh, can also influence um, these indicators that we look at for quality. So we look at water flow rates, water sources, water loss and use, precipitation and temperature or climate. And then we can measure things like the pH, metals, nutrients that are in the water, how much oxygen is available for the life within the lake. Um, and this tells us about lake water quality. So um, in addition to these things, we also look at policy and we look at what knowledge gaps are out there. So um, today I'm going to be talking to you about these two lakes, Antler Lake and Hubble's Lake, because, well, they're near and dear to my heart. They're reports that I, I wrote, but um, they also tell very different stories, despite the fact that they have a lot of similarities. They're very, they're two very different lakes, um, and you'll see what I mean by that as we go along. So really the story starts with the last glaciation about 17,000 years ago, when the ice sheets were starting to uh, melt and and what we see, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, um, but we see where the ice sheets separated along the Rocky Mountains and, and then how they receded over time. And during that time in the Edmonton area, we had Glacial Lake Edmonton. And there are a lot of things happening during um, the retreat of glaciers. It's something that you can see now if you go to the Icefields Parkway. So what you probably see a lot of um, is this buildup of glacial till. So this is basically uh, rocks and sand and sediment. Um, so as the glaciers are retreating, uh, they leave all of this behind. And what can happen a lot of times is that pieces of ice will break off of the glacier and then they'll get buried in the sediment. And over time, um, what will happen is that that ice will disappear and it'll change the, the structure of the land to where it will have these hills and valleys and they will fill up with water from precipitation and you'll get what is called a kettle lake. And you can probably see a lot of these in the mountains, um, but kind of fast forwarding in time uh, from when we had Glacial Lake Edmonton, now we have these interesting landforms that have appeared 
um, around Edmonton as a result of this. So we have the Carvel Pitted Delta, which is west of Edmonton. And we have the Beaver Hills Moraine, which is east of Edmonton. And in both of these areas are, um, are defined by their hummocky, hilly nature. Um, they are the, the layer beneath the soil and above the bedrock is full of this glacial till. So the land is very permeable, meaning that water can flow through to groundwater quite quickly. So there are also groundwater recharge zones in these areas because of that. So within the Carvel Pitted Delta is where Hubble's Lake lies, and within the Beaver Hills Moraine is where Antler Lake lies. So something interesting that both of these lakes have in common as well is that they are both within the dry mixed wood ecoregions. So you can see here that um, there is the dry mixed wood ecoregion in the Beaver Hills Moraine, and it's, it's sort of an island of that that is surrounded by central parkland ecoregion. And then to the west, you have more of this dry mixed wood ecoregion, which is where Hubble's Lake is. And these areas are defined by these undulating plains, they also have aspen-dominated forests and fens, which are types of wetlands. So Hubble's Lake is within the Sturgeon subwatershed, and it's only its watershed is very small. It's only 1.6 kilometers squared. So you can see that here. Whereas the Antler Lake watershed lies within the Beaver Hills subwatershed to the east of Edmonton, and it's a bit larger. It's 11.25 kilometers squared. And for both of those, um, that's the effective drainage area, so that's not including the lake surface. So Hubble's Lake is a really interesting lake because it's, it's deep, so it's thermally stratified, and it's a closed basin. So what do I mean by that? Well, if, if you look here, you can see that there are four deep holes in the lake and each of them are about 25 to 30 meters deep. And so what that does is it creates these layers within the water that are um, separated by temperature. So down here at the bottom, you have very cold temperatures. And then up at the top, you can have up to 20, 25 degrees. Um, and that changes a lot um, of the factors within the lake when it comes to uh, where the oxygen is and where the nutrients are and what is available for um, plants and fish. Um, and so you'll find that in these upper layers, you have very little nutrients and a lot of oxygen available. But as you go down, the nutrients will settle. And so you'll have high amounts of nutrients and you'll have zero oxygen. And because of the way that this lake is shaped, um, it has very steep slopes that go into it. Um, so it's really blocked by the wind. You don't get a lot of mixing in this lake. And so these layers remain stratified uh, throughout the year. You will have some mixing between the top two layers um, during the summer and probably a little bit during the winter. Um, but for the most part, they stay separated. It's a very different story when we look at Antler Lake. So this is a very shallow lake. Its uh, maximum depth is 4.69 meters. And it is not in a closed basin. It's hydrologically connected to nearby lakes and it has a lot of streams that go in and out of the lake. And so it's interesting because actually it connects to Cooking Lake, Hastings Lake. It goes through Hastings Creek into Beaver Hills Lake, which goes into Beaver Hill Creek and eventually into the North Saskatchewan River. Now, whether that actually is still happening, we don't have a good idea of because it really depends on how much precipitation we've gotten in that year. As many of you may know from going to the, maybe the Beaver Hills uh, Bird Observatory or um, to the Beaver Hill Lake area, you're, you go there and you're like, well, where's the lake? Well, um, 
it's dried up uh, for quite a few years. And every once in a while, when we get a heavy uh, rainstorm, we will get some water in there. And so it, it has the potential of draining, but it's a part of a very big system. Um, and overall, in a, in a regional sense of things, uh, lake levels are declining. So this graph here is showing you Hubble's Lake in this red line. And what we're seeing are a bunch of lakes that are within the same region in the Sturgeon sub watershed. And we are looking at the comparison or the percent difference between 1996 and years prior and years after. And what we see is that regionally, lake levels are declining and they have been since the early 90s. And we see the same trend when looking at um, the lakes in the Beaver Hill region as well. So looking at Antler Lake and Gray versus Hastings and Cooking Lake. Uh, this time we're looking at actual elevation as opposed to the percent difference, but we see that overall since the mid nineties, they are declining as well. So why are they declining? Is it the way that we're using it? Is it climate change? Uh, well, the way that we look at this is with the water balance equation. So the change in water storage is really just the water inputs minus the water outputs. And so we look at precipitation, inflow, groundwater, and then we look at things like evaporation, um, if it's leaving the lake through outflow or groundwater or diversions, how are we using the water? And so for Hubble's Lake, we have a net loss of water, and this is really due to evaporation and higher evaporation than precipitation because there is no real surface inflow because it's a closed system. We don't know a lot about the groundwater connection there. It's suspected that it's quite small. There's no outflow. We don't know a lot about diversions, but suspect that it is very low. So really it's evaporation that we suspect is the reason why lake levels are dropping. And the same story can be told for Antler Lake. And this lake does have surface inflow. It has some groundwater interactions and it has outflow. It doesn't have any diversions, um, because uh, people either use um, the city water or sometimes wells. But again, evaporation is higher than precipitation. So this means that climate change is having a huge impact on the amount of water that is in these lakes. So how might that affect these lakes? Well, really, it can have a huge effect on the amount of nutrients that are in the lake. Um, and how that is impacting uh, the biological productivity of the lake. Um, so if we look at a selection of lakes and look at um, their eutrophic values, Antler Lake is considered to be hyper eutrophic, whereas Hubble's Lake is between oligotrophic and mesotrophic. And so what does that mean? Well, typically in an oligotrophic or mesotrophic lake, these will have high clarity and low productivity, meaning that there are low nutrient levels, which allows for good light penetration. They'll have high dissolved oxygen and typically deeper waters. And as you become more eutrophic, meaning you have more nutrients added into the system, you'll have more algal growth, more plant growth, but this will also reduce the amount of dissolved oxygen and light penetration available. And as your lake becomes more and more shallow because you have more siltation, um, you have less light um, being able to penetrate down deep, um, you will have uh, more nutrients that are settling into the, sed oops, into the sediment and, um, and you might be able, to, you might get dead zones uh, because of a lack of oxygen. So that means that you're going to have less fish that are able to live there um, and you're nearing the end of your lake's lifetime. So just looking at time here, I see I'm, I'm, I need to hurry up here. So uh, just quickly uh, looking at water quality. 
Overall, Hubble's Lake, because it's so deep and stratified, has excellent water clarity. It has good oxygen at the top layers, but not below 11 meters. Uh, the nutrients are low in the top layer, but very high at the lake bottom. So as they come into the lake, they're just settling down into the sediment. Whereas Antler Lake is the exact opposite. It's also starting to get saltier um, and the metals are starting to concentrate as well. And they experience cyan cyanobacteria blooms. So looking at uh, lake land use and uh, how that might affect longevity. Uh, Petra gave us a good intro into um, some of the things that we need to consider. We all would love to have a beautiful lake view from our window, but how does that actually impact the life of the lakes? So looking at the Hubble's Lake watershed, we see that a large percentage of it is actually development. There's these are all of the subdivisions that are within the Hubble's Lake uh, watershed and they're all surrounding the lake. The rest of the land use in the watershed is for agricultural purposes. There are still quite a bit of trees around the area and a lot of this has to do with slope. When we look at antler, it's a little different. There's a lot less development. There's a lot more agriculture happening and they also have some environmental reserves in place. So this is another uh, look here at land use. So you have a lot of development within this island and around the east shore of the lake, whereas there's very little to none uh, to no development around the west side, but you do have some other developments occurring. Um, so developments can have a huge effect on riparian intactness, um, particularly at Hubble's. Um, Riparian intactness is very low where you have uh, the greatest concentration of development right along the shoreline. Uh, so this information was uh, done with our large riparian intactness study. Uh, so looking at Hubble's Lake, we can see um, that a pretty good proportion of, of the uh, shoreline is in very low intactness. Um, and those areas are also targeted for high restoration priority. Um, and these areas are, are where we have RV parks um, as well as residential homes. And the areas, uh, when we look at a satellite image or if you go around the lake, the areas that are doing really well have a much higher slope and can't be developed right up to the shoreline. So their riparian areas are more intact. Looking at antler, because of the way that development is, 54% um, of the shoreline is not developed. So that's this green area here. So the riparian areas are doing a lot better in these sections than they are where development is occurring. We haven't been able yet to do um, a riparian intactness assessment um, in the same way that we did for Hubble's, but um, we are getting there uh, very soon. So overall, uh, these lakes, they're very different. One is very deep, one is very shallow, um, but they have a lot of similarities in their ecoregions and the way that people have developed around them. And so they have a lot of similar threats to their longevity. And so heavy development to the land is a huge threat to their longevity, especially to reducing the riparian function. And so for both of these lakes, we need to focus on restoring the riparian areas so that we reduce the amount of nutrients going into the lakes. For both of them also, the ground is very permeable because of that glacial till. So this really puts the groundwater at risk if uh, activities that are occurring around the lake are causing um, anything to enter the groundwater. Um, they both suffer from high nutrient levels, but in different ways. So Antler Lake is currently experiencing cyanobacteria blooms, whereas Hubble's Lake is not yet. But if it continues to lose water, then it might start having cyanobacteria blooms as well. And so these long-term declining trends in water quantity play a huge role in what is happening in these lakes. And so I'm just going to go ahead and finish up there and say thank you all for your time today. Um, I know this was a very brief overview, but please go take a look at our, our reports and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle.
and uh, that was very well timed. So we're right on the button. So I just want to thank everybody for attending. Remind them that we have uh, another West Watershed Wednesday on April 28th. Um, maybe at least you can share the last poll as people are going, they can answer it. Um, but um, I also did draw a name for the gift. So uh, Dwayne Landles is going to be the recipient of our gift basket. So thanks again for everybody uh, attending today. It is really hard to do a presentation in 20 minutes. So thank you, Petra and Michelle. And then um, hopefully we'll see you again. If you don't get a copy of our newsletter, which is the question, do you receive our newsletters? Um, just go to our website, you know, www.nswa.ab.ca and uh, you can uh, sign up and you'll find out a lot more about lakes and other uh, topics in the watershed.